Thank you so much, guys, and, uh, and thank you too, Carl, for your very kind words to myself and the team. But I have to say, I have found this weekend to have been such a blessing and such a thrill to be able to be here and to share with you some of the things that just burn in my heart and my desire to see people equipped and confident in the Word of God right from the beginning. And that's what Creation Ministries is all about. So to have that privilege and opportunity is, is very, very precious to us. When I was a young man, I had a passionate interest in astronomy. I loved the stars. I guess maybe that's why I ended up working in the aerospace industry. It was about the closest I could get to the stars. <laughs> but you know, ever since the beginning of, of history, people have been fascinated by the stars. Now when you live in a big city like I do in Sydney, you're lucky to see any stars. You might get two or three really bright ones, but every now and again when we get an opportunity to get out into the countryside on a dark, moonless night, it is truly a breathtaking sight, isn't it? You all know what I mean, I hope. Well, way back in uh, 300 BC, Aristotle started to uh, put together a model of what the universe was like, and he figured out that maybe the Earth was at the centre and that the sun and moon and the stars all revolved around it. And uh, he had some other ideas. He was a mathematician and a logician. But that was way back 300 BC. And then a very clever guy called Eratosthenes, 240 BC, note the date. He figured out the radius of the Earth by doing some very clever experiments and measurements. And you know, he got the radius of the Earth correct to within 2% of the actual answer. 240 BC. Now hang on a minute, that means that mankind has known that the Earth is a sphere since 240 BC. Sadly, there's a whole bunch of people today who are being led astray by this idea that the Earth is flat. <laughs> Sometimes Christians are accused of being flat earthers. Interestingly enough, just as an aside, there is a flat earth society in the US but the leader of the Flat Earth Society is an evolutionist. But anyway, let's move on. <laughs> but friends, the Earth is not flat. It's a very sad development that's happening where people are being misled by very poor biblical exegesis and uh, following conspiracy theories and the like, and it actually brings disrepute into the body of Christ, and it, that saddens me. There is so much evidence that the Earth is a sphere. A couple of months ago in the US there was a total solar eclipse and uh, this little graphic shows the shadow of the moon passing across the Americas, particular North America. And uh, you watch as it comes by again, there's a little black dot in the centre, that's the area of total eclipse. You'll notice it comes quite rapidly in there from the west, slows down as it traverses the US and then moves more quickly off to the edge. And notice too that large shadow shape around it, that's called the penumbra. People in that area would have observed a partial solar eclipse. Now that is highly predictable. People knew exactly where to be to experience the eclipse. They knew exactly what they would see at other locations, the extent of the partial eclipse, when it would start, when it would stop. None of that prediction can take place and be verified experimentally unless the Earth is a sphere and unless the Moon is a sphere, unless the Sun is a sphere and they are all in the relative positions that we understand them to be in. The evidence is abundant that the Earth is a sphere. I shared with you uh, earlier on that I worked in the aerospace industry and I was involved in the design of geostationary satellites. Those satellites orbit the Earth and they travel around the Earth fast enough to maintain a, an apparently fixed position in the sky. They're actually moving at about three kilometres a second to keep up. Now, companies like Optus and many other companies around the world spend hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on communication spacecraft to provide television broadcast services and the like, none of which would work if the Earth was flat. And we've been doing it now since the 1960s. Friends, please don't get caught up in this. There's a wonderful article on our website. If you go to creation.com, just type in the, the search window, Flat Earth, and you'll find a, an excellent article written by one of our, two of our scientists actually, that goes through the physical evidence and talks about the biblical passages that people are misconstruing. So, back to my history chart. 
So after uh, Eratosthenes, we have Ptolemy. Now, Ptolemy came 150 AD. He kind of refined the Aristotle uh, model a bit because people were observing that the planets weren't quite well behaved. They seemed to wander a bit. That's where the name planet comes from, by the way. It means wanderer from the Greek. And so he developed a series of epicycles and complicated ways of predicting the movement of the planets. And nothing happened for about 1,400 years until the Reformation. Remember the Reformation that we uh, talked about? It was the first night, wasn't it? Martin Luther, 1517, on the 31st of October, nearly 500 years ago, nailed up those 95 theses onto the church door. Remember what they were? Salvation is, uh, sorry, salvation is one by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, on the authority of Scripture alone for the glory of God alone. That's right. Now, Martin Luther's approach had a radical effect because people now started to read the Bible. It coincided with the development of the printing press. Isn't God's timing wonderful? And so the Scriptures were made available to people. They could read them. They, they saw that this, this universe that God has made is, is predictable. It's worth studying to work out how it works. And Copernicus developed what he called a, a heliocentric model, the sun at the centre, the planets orbited the sun. Then Galileo, a very short time later, turned a telescope to the heavens and he found some remarkable things. He found there were moons that orbited the planet Jupiter and uh, he found not only that, which means, by the way, that not everything was orbiting around the sun. And he also discovered that the sun had blemishes on it called sunspots and that kind of blew the Aristotelian view that the heavenly bodies were perfect, out of the water, so to speak. And then Johannes Kepler came and uh, he developed the laws of planetary motion. Uh, some remarkable scientific work done there. And then the birth of modern physics came with Newton, who developed the laws of gravity and motion. And uh, then Einstein, about 100 years ago, the breakthrough development in relativity and the general and special uh, relativity equations. And today we have all kinds of amazing instruments that enable us to explore the heavens. Some of those are based on the ground. They work in the optical range, that is the visible spectrum. Others work in radio uh, spectral parts. I've worked on radio telescopes as part of my doctoral research. But now we have telescopes that actually orbit the Earth and get up and out of the atmosphere and its disturbing effects. Of course, the Hubble Space Telescope and other spacecraft that operate in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And using these amazing devices, which are all based, by the way, on observable, repeatable experiments, that's real science, they return some of the most remarkable images. Now, these are images that are, are um, collages, if you like, of different parts of the spectrum, some with false colour, so they're laid on top of one another so you can see the detail. But all of that beauty and wonder has been there in the heavens ever since the creation. But it's only been in the last couple of decades that we have had the technology to be able to see these things. But when I look at these, I'm reminded of the psalmist's words, the heavens declare the glory of God. The stars, the skies rather, proclaim the work of his hands. But friends... There's another story. And that story is best typified, I think, with this man, Carl Sagan. Back in 1980, there was a TV documentary series released in the US. It was called Cosmos. And in the first episode, Carl Sagan strides onto the set and he says, in solemn, priestly tones, the cosmos is all that is, or that ever was, or ever will be. Wow, that sounds like a quote out of scripture almost, doesn't it? <laughs> But what does he actually mean? What he's saying is, there is no God. Now, if Sagan had come onto the TV sets and said, there is no God, most of America would have turned it off straight away or changed channels. But instead of that, he said it in uh, such a solemn way. So what he's suggesting is that the cosmos is, if you like, you can think of it as a, a cosmic box. And... All of the space-time matter universe is contained therein and there's absolutely nothing outside of it. But the Bible gives us a different history, doesn't it? 
It says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So outside the cosmic box, we have God, who is separate from his creation, the space-time universe, but yet intimately involved in it, and particularly with the pinnacle of his creative effort, namely you and me. Now, it just so happens that I have a cosmic box with me today. <laughs> and here it is. Now, in here is the entire space-time universe. It's very heavy. <laughs> but you see, what Carl Sagan is saying is that all we have is what's in the box, nothing else. We have no recourse to any other information about this box. So we can look in the box and from studying how the box works, we should be able to figure out how the box came to be. All we've got is the cosmic box. Let me tell you a story about two fleas. <laughs> now, these two fleas lived in a car. It was not my car. But they lived in the back of the car. And, but they were very intelligent fleas, and they observed that the car had a number of things about it that made it operate. It had a wheel, it had an engine, it's got windscreen wipers and lights. And, and these fleas were fascinated by this and they analysed how this car worked. And then one of them said to the other, how did the car come to be? And they thought, oh, that's interesting. So they tried to explain how the car came into being in terms of the things that they could observe about how it operated. Now, that's a hopeless task because they have absolutely no understanding or no experience of production lines, robotic welding systems, plastic extrusions, computer-aided design systems, testing tracks, and all the things that go into making a car. You see, the processes that are involved in the operation of something are not the same as the processes involved in the creation. So when you look in the cosmic box, as Carl Sagan is doing, you have no way of determining from figuring out how it works, how it came to be. These are fundamentally, philosophically different challenges. So, what does this book tell us? It tells us that God created the heavens and the earth in just six days. And on the fourth day, it says this, and God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate day from night and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. So God tells us what he did. You see, you can't look in the cosmic box to find out how it was made. You have to go instead to the revelation of the Creator that he's provided to us. That's how we find out how it was made. But the secular story is what we call the Big Bang, and it looks something like this. Some 14 or so billion years ago, there was a quantum fluctuation when absolutely nothing became absolutely everything. Initially, it was in the form of a hot plasma gas, which condensed down, became hydrogen. Somehow, other stars formed, and. They burnt their thermonuclear fuel, some exploded as supernovas and, and more complex molecules were formed and then we ended up with this swirling cloud of dust and gas and at the centre of that swirling cloud condensed out our sun and then came the planets orbiting the sun, more complex molecules were formed and then finally this amazing double helix molecule with all the assembly instructions for making living organisms. So in a nutshell, if you like, that is the Big Bang secular story of our origins. Now somebody rather tongue-in-cheek once said, now students, hydrogen is a gas which, if left long enough, turns into people. <laughs> now friends, let's just think about this for a moment. Explosions just leave a random debris field behind them. 
Explosions do not lead to structure and order. We never observe that in the physical world, do we? This building didn't come about as a result of an explosion. It came about because of purposeful design, planning and hard work. Now, this next image I want to show you will come as a shock to many of you. And so I just want to prepare you for it, but this is definitely not my daughter's bedroom. <laughs> now, if the principle of the Big Bang, that an explosion should lead to structure and order, were true, then all you'd need to do is ask the young lady to leave the room, create an explosion, and hey presto, it looked like that. <laughs> but we know that's not what happens, is it? Now to get to that stage, there's a few people looking a little bit sheepish around here. <laughs> to get to that stage, you would need firstly, I'm sure, some discipline, then some intelligence and hard work. You see, order and structure does not come about through random processes. But then people say, ah, oh, but hang on a minute. The earth is not a closed system. There's the sun and it shines heat and light down onto the surface of the earth. And it's that heat and light which generates order and structure out of the chaos. Well, let's look at this for a minute. Here's a machine which has been very carefully designed and it takes the raw energy and the chemical bonds of petrol and converts it into mechanical energy which, driven through the gearbox of your car, propels the car along. But if you took exactly the same fuel and poured it over the top of the car and ignited it, you get a different result. <laughs> you see, friends, this is an uncontrolled application of raw energy in an unintelligent, undesigned environment. So to get structure and order such as we see everywhere in the universe, it only comes by an external agent of intelligence and great power acting onto the physical universe. Professor Paul Davies, whom I've quoted several times this weekend, says this, the Big Bang represents the instantaneous suspension of physical laws, the sudden abrupt flash of lawlessness that allowed something to come out of nothing. It represents a true miracle. Now in that passage in outlining the events of day four, there's a delightful throwaway line. And it says in verse 16, and he made the stars also. Just like that. Now, stars really are not complicated things at all, at the risk of offending any astrophysicist that might be here tonight, compared with the stunning complexity of a self-replicating living organism, such as we've talked about last night. Now, some people actually have, uh, have uh, called me, well, let me back up a minute. Stars are really just big balls of gas. That's really all they are. Now, I've been called that by various people, <laughs> but I realised that what they meant was I was a star, so I took it as a compliment. <laughs> but what do we actually see? Is there any evidence of the stars having been deliberately made? Now, back in the early 1900s, there was a man called Edwin Hubble, and he turned his telescope to the stars and he discovered a remarkable thing. That in every direction that he looked, the further away stars and galaxies were, the greater the light received from them was shifted towards the red end of the spectrum. Now, I'm not going to go into any great science and depth behind this, but redshift is a phenomenon that is not unreasonably related to the speed at which an object is receding from us. So the further away these things were, the faster they were receding. And he discovered that in every direction that he looked. So let's think about that. If you pointed your telescope in all these different directions and you saw all these things receding from you, where would that put you? Somewhere near the middle, wouldn't it? But this was a big problem. And Hubble said, such a condition would imply that we occupy a unique position in the universe but the unwelcome supposition of a favoured location must be avoided at all costs and is intolerable. Now why? Why? What's wrong with being in a special place? All observers, regardless of location, will see the same general a picture of the universe. This principle is a sheer assumption. However, the assumption is adopted. 
There must be no favoured location in the universe, no centre, no boundary. All must see the universe alike. Now, friends, that's a philosophical position. He simply doesn't like what the data is telling him. <laughs> now, this is called the cosmological principle, and it undergirds all of cosmology today. And basically what it says is, the Earth is not special. We don't want it to be special. Because if it's special, it might have been created. And if it's been created, there might be a creator. Oh, that's not a good idea. We don't want that. We want to be the rulers of our own lives, masters of our own destiny. We don't want to acknowledge a, a creator God. So this principle is now applied to all of cosmology. But what do we observe? Well, some people have done some extensive surveys of the redshifts of galaxies, the most famous of these being the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Now over half a million galaxies have been surveyed. Now, if the Big Bang explosion was true, you'd expect to see a general random scatter of galaxies spread out throughout the universe. But instead of that, it's extremely clumpy. And this structure, for instance, here is called the Great Wall. It's uh, 1.4 billion light years across. If I've remembered that correctly, that's right. Professor John Hartnett, who actually lives here in Perth, was at University of Western Australia for a while and University of Adelaide and is, uh, has a high profile as a cosmologist in the secular world, has done an analysis on the Sloan Digital Sky uh, Survey work. And he's found that, in fact, you can inscribe, it's a bit hard to see those, isn't it, but there is a series of concentric circles that fit that data with the Milky Way galaxy at or near the centre. And that is a straightforward way to interpret the evidence. That's kind of interesting. It makes the cosmological principle look a bit uncomfortable, doesn't it? There we are. Our Milky Way galaxy is close to the centre of the visible known universe that we can see. And it's highly structured and ordered. Friends, that's not the result of a random explosion. Now, what about the origin of the stars and the planets? Well, there's a theory around that it all started with this swirling dust cloud that I talked about earlier on. And uh, in this little uh, animation here, we see the sun forming, or a star rather, forming at the centre. And then close to that, swirling around here, you'll see the dust and gas coalesces. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. And it forms a planet and uh, it leaves what's called a planetary gap. There's a little planet and then the next process is formed and the next planet further out and so on. And all this is supposed to have happened through random unguided processes. Now, one of the problems with this model is that as soon as the star starts, starts to burn, it radiates lots of heat and light and that has the effect of dissipating that cloud of dust and gas. So the planets actually don't have long to form up before that dust cloud has been dispersed. But there are a number of challenges here. The first is that some random, random cloud of dust and gas has to form into a disk shape. And this is called the, the micron-sized barrier. So if you have a very small particle, um, and we're talking here about something in the order of a, a millionth of a, a metre, a micron grain, it'll take about 10 million years to settle into the mid-plane, which is very slow. In fact, it's too slow to form planets before the disk disperses. Now, what I'm quoting here are notes taken from Swinburne University, and uh, these are notes for an, an astrophysics course, but you'll find this sort of stuff in, in all sorts of textbooks. So, basically, they admit that it's too slow to work. So, what do they say? So, other processes must be at work. I've got no idea what they are, but they must be at work because we're all here, aren't we? So we got here somehow, so it must work. Anyway, let's move quickly on past the micron-sized barrier, but then we come to the metre-sized barrier. Now, when these particles have coalesced, they get a bit bigger, and then they get to about a, a metre in diameter. But it turns out that once they get to that size, they will then spiral into the protostar in only about 100 years. While the mechanism is not yet fully understood, the grains will eventually become kilometre-sized planetesimals. But we don't know how. Well, that's awkward, but we'll move along. Let's not get stuck on details. And now these things get to be a kilometre or so in diameter. 
And now these things, uh, planetesimals, they call they they collide and they stick together and grow, and finally they, be, they become planets like like planet Earth. But friends, let's think about this a minute. If these things were that big, and they crashed into each other, they would simply disintegrate. Once the planetesimals have been formed, further growth of planets may occur through their gravitational accretion into large bodies. Just how that takes place is not understood. <laughs> Friends, they've got no idea. This nebula hypothesis model simply does not work. And yet, it's served up in TV documentary after TV documentary after TV documentary as though it was all nailed down. But it's not. You see, when you look inside the box to try and work out how the box was made, you get the wrong answers, especially when you begin with the assumption that there is no God. Well, when we look at the solar system, we discover that the planets all seem to revolve in the same direction. Well, that sounds like a swirling cloud of dust and gas, and the sun and the planets go, the, oops, one of them goes the wrong way. In fact, it turns out the two of them do. Both Venus and Uranus have retrograde motion. But there's another problem. The Sun has more than 99% of the mass of the solar system, but less than 1% of its angular momentum. That's the tendency to keep spinning. Now, angular momentum and mass should be proportional to one another. So how did the Sun lose all of its angular momentum and deliver it out to the planets? Once again, nobody knows. The terrestrial planets that are close into the Sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars, they're reasonably close in terms of that area of that putative swirling dust cloud, so they should have similar kinds of geochemical properties. But instead, you know, we visited every single one of them with space probes and had a close look, and they're all different, radically different. The ice and gas giants, likewise. Well, the problem here is, though, even worse, because Jupiter and Saturn are huge planets. But the dust cloud wouldn't have stayed around long enough to form such large gaseous planets. So they shouldn't be there. But they are. Well, there are some problems with the nebula hypothesis. There's no mechanism known to form planetesimals or planets. The Sun has more than 99% of the solar system's mass, but less than 1% of its angular momentum. The planets should rotate in the same direction, but Venus and Uranus do not. Neighbouring planets and their moons should have similar composition, but they're all unique. The gas and ice giants should not exist, but they do. The observed data do not support the nebula hypothesis. But then it gets even worse. Here's an amazing case of a planet which is very, very close to its, uh, its star, its host star. A rocky planet, 20% larger than the Earth, and it orbits its star in just eight and a half hours. Now we take 365 and a quarter days to orbit our star. It would have formed, therefore, inside its own star's region of the cloud, if the nebula hypothesis is true. And the lead scientist said this, it couldn't have formed in place because you can't form a planet inside a star. It couldn't have formed further out and migrated inward because it would have migrated all the way into the star. This planet is an enigma. Isn't it interesting? You see, when you start with the wrong assumptions, you inevitably end up with conclusions that do not match the observed universe. But friends, we're not told about this, are we? We're told as though it's all a done deal. I love this quote from Joseph Silk. He said, among the outstanding problems are how and when the universe began how galaxies formed and attained their observed array of shapes and sizes, how stars are born, and how planets and life evolved. <laughs> Is there anything else? <laughs> <laughs> and yet, our Father, Creator God, has revealed to us what he did. And he's told us that he did it all about 6,000 years ago. And the Bible lays out that timeline. Well, is there any evidence? Too right there is. Everywhere you look, you find evidence of a young solar system and a young universe. Io, one of the fiery little moons that orbits Jupiter, it has volcanic eruptions. It's actually dissipating an enormous amount of heat. 
Although it's only a quarter of its diameter, it releases far more energy, heat energy, than the Earth does. Now, tidal dissipations, that's the gravitational interaction, accounts for only a tenth of the heat loss. So Io would have cooled down by now if it was four and a half billion years old. It can only be thousands of years old. This is an interesting uh, mission, the Cassini-Huygens mission to Saturn. It came to an end just a few weeks ago, in fact, on the 15th of September, a month ago today. And I had the great privilege of actually seeing the Huygens probe uh, when it was under construction in the US. And uh, this is a very successful mission. It uh, reached Saturn in 2004, and it's been orbiting it and taking samples and making measurements for 13 years. And it's found some interesting things. After four and a half billion years, Saturn's rings should have accumulated lots of dust. They should be quite dull and dirty. Yet the ice in the rings is remarkably clean compared to the predicted contamination from billions of years of micrometeorite pollution. They look young. Saturn's rings are rapidly growing dimmer. They can't have lasted for four and a half billion years. And to quote, none of these delicate rings seem likely to persist for even a tiny fraction of the lifetime of the main rings. And the main rings already look young. Saturn rings don't all orbit the planet in the same direction. Get a load of this one. The newly discovered Phoebe ring is orbiting Saturn backwards. How does that stack up with the nebula hypothesis? I can just imagine God saying, I'll spin this one the other way. <laughs> That'll get them thinking. <laughs> we had a marvellous article in our Creation magazine, Young Saturn. I really do encourage you folks to get hold of the Creation magazine. It's got brilliant stuff that is really, really helpful. Here is one that was um, only published in uh, September, uh, just last month. And the tiny moons of Uranus are doomed to collide. Now, there's a whole bunch of little moons close in and orbiting Uranus. There's a group of 13 of them but they're clustered in a space separated by just 10,000 kilometres. Now what that means is because they're so close as they pass by each other, they interfere and disturb each other. In only about a million years, Cressida will probably strike Desdemona. A similar fate awaits the moons Cupid and Belinda, which will hit each other. Now they're all very Shakespearean names here, but the point is, how could they have been around for four and a half billion years, the claimed age of the solar system, and still be there? They're obviously very young. When the New Horizons spacecraft flew past Pluto a few years ago, it discovered some amazing things about its moons. Typically, small moons end up, thanks to strong tidal interaction, just the gravitational effects, locked in spin rates that match their orbital periods. That is, so that one face of the little moon always faces its, uh, its planet, just like our moon always faces our Earth. That's the norm in satellite systems of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, but not so with the moons of Pluto. So let's have a look at what Pluto's moons are doing out there. So first of all, here you see Pluto with that little white dot there, and that moon is called Charon. The two of them orbit each other, both looking at each other, tidally locked together. Then the first moon is Styx. It's that red one. There it is. Orbits every 3.24 days. Then Nix, the yellow one. But whoops! Nix is orbiting backwards. Another problem. Kerberos is green. It orbits every 5.3 days. But look at little Hydra in blue. It's screaming around every 10.3 hours. Now, friends, those little moons are subject to gravitational potentials because of Pluto that it's orbiting. That has a braking effect which should cause it and will and does cause it to slow down. It can't have been there for four and a half billion years. You see, the evidence in our solar system tells us that the solar system is young. It's not four and a half billion years old at all. I mentioned this article, I've mentioned it several times. The Age of the Earth, you'll find it at creation.com forward slash age. It lists 101 evidences that the, the Earth and the world is nowhere near the claimed evolutionary ages. There are 31 astronomical evidences given in that article. I encourage you to go and have a look at it. But people have been fascinated by this question. Are there Earth-like planets out there? Is our solar system and our, our Earth something special? Or are we just ordinary? NASA had a mission called the Kepler Space Telescope. And its objective was to determine how common Earth-sized and larger planets are 
in the habitable zone of sun-like stars. Now this was a very successful mission. It uh, was launched in 2009. It actually had a problem in May 2013, but they've managed to modify it, so it's still operating and collecting data. But what does it mean when we talk about the habitable zone of a planet, of, 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 a, of a star? What it means is an area where liquid water could potentially exist, because life depends upon liquid water. So if a planet is too close to its star, it'll be too hot, and you won't be able to have liquid water, it'll be just boiled off. If it's too far out, then it'll be too cold and frozen. So there's a kind of what they call a Goldilocks zone, where things are just right for liquid water to exist. Now, the Kepler Space Telescope had some very clever technology. I love this stuff because this is the example of how real science operates. And what they figured was there must be a reasonable number of systems of planets out there that we see edge on. So as the planet comes between us and the sun, the light from that star, rather, will dip. So if you can watch the light from a star and notice little dips in it and analyse the dips, you should be able to work out how many planets are orbiting it, how big the planets are, and all sorts of interesting things. It turns out that making measurements from ground-based uh, telescopes, you can also measure the extent to which the stars wobble as the planets orbit them. Now you might think that sounds pretty fantastic, but you know, if you take a child and hold them by the hands and swing them around, you have to lean backwards, don't you? You lean away from them to counterbalance. And it's a bit like that. So as the, the uh, planet orbits the star, the star actually gets pulled around a bit by the mass of the planet. And uh, using these techniques, both the transit method and the Doppler shift um, of the wobble, it's possible to discover the size, density, and the distance away that a planet is from its parent star. Now, this is all gee whiz stuff. I love it. It's wonderful. But what have they actually found? Now, it gets a little bit complicated to unravel what they've found, but here is a chart that shows the number of confirmed exoplanets, as they're called, planets outside of our solar system, as of last month. Now, I just want to unpack this a bit for you because it tells a fascinating story. On this vertical axis, we have the mass of the planet. Now, this scale is not linear. Each of these divisions here shows a multiplication by 10. But it's normalised to 1, where 1 is the mass of Jupiter. So planets on this line have one-tenth the mass of Jupiter, on this line a hundredth of the mass of Jupiter, a thousandth, one ten-thousandth, and so on, and up here 10 times and 20 times. Along the bottom is the distance between the planet and its star. And just to confuse everybody, it's normalised to the distance that the Earth is from the Sun. So 1 is where the Earth is relative to its Sun, uh, our Sun rather. That's a tenth of the distance, a hundredth of the distance going the other way, 10 times, 100 times. Now, what you're looking at there is a cluster of 3,000 dots. The different colours represent the different means by which people have detected these planets. And uh, we find some interesting things. Now, the first thing to note up here are these ones. These are called red-hot Jupiters. Now, let's have a look at them for a minute. These are the mass of Jupiter, up to 10 and 20 times as big as Jupiter. But look how close they are to their star. In some cases, about a hundredth of the distance that we are from our sun. So you have massive planets close into the sun, hurtling around, some in the matter of just hours and days. Friends, that's a violent environment. So violent that the planets are actually being destroyed. They're having matter ripped off them and sucked into the star or blasted away by radiation pressure. But wait a minute. They're supposed to have been there for billions of years. But they can't have been if that's the environment. You see, hot Jupiters tell us that they haven't been there very long. They're young. And what about these guys? These are hot terrestrials, probably tidally locked, very, very close to their star again, closer than Mercury is to our sun, for instance, and uh, about the size of the Earth and uh, what have you, but highly likely that they are gravitationally locked to their star, meaning that one side faces the star, so it'll be hot, inhospitable. The other side is in permanent darkness. It'll be cold not suitable for life at all. So where does our solar system fit? And this is the bit that I love. 
So here are our four terrestrial planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. You notice they're out there by themselves, all four of them. You see, we don't live in a typical solar system at all. It's very atypical. What about the gas giants? Here's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, all of them out there by their own, except Jupiter's probably on the edge. But the eight major planets in our solar system bear little resemblance to everything else that's been found. So why are we being told, friends, in the newspaper reports and the documentaries, that we just live in a common or garden, everyday solar system, the like of which we find everywhere, there's billions of them, there's nothing special. Remember the cosmological principle? Nothing special about the Earth. But oh, how special we really are. But it's not only our planets. You see, an exceptional solar system requires an exceptional star. Compared to the intense and violent activity seen on other stars, our sun is remarkably even-tempered and well-mannered. It doesn't flare or pulse like other stars. When solar flares do occur, they're not so violent as to vaporise our oceans, or worse. Now, the secularists are aware of this problem, and in unguarded moments, they admit it. And this uh, astronomer said, we are now beginning to understand that nature seems to overwhelmingly prefer systems quite unlike our own solar system. So our solar system is, in a, some sense, a bit of a freak and not the most typical kind of system that nature cooks up. How inconvenient. We're looking special again. And then this astronomer said, the discovery of thousands of star systems wildly different from our own has demolished ideas about how planets form. Astronomers are searching for a whole new theory. <laughs> Friends, when you look in the box and you begin with the assumption that there is no God, <laughs> no wonder you get confused and come up with results that do not match the observations in the cosmos. Mercury and Venus are hot, sterile, Mars is a toxic wasteland, and so on out. In between Venus and Mars lies this amazing blue jewel called Earth. Blessed with water, greenery, and life in almost every cranny and nook. It has the right magnetic shield, the right solar energy, the right continental minerals, the right atmosphere, the right carbon, oxygen, water, nitrogen cycles, and a moon that is at the right distance, density, and orbit. Everything is just right. It's the Goldilocks planet. But is that a surprise? What does the word of God say? For this is what the Lord says. He who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. He did not create it to be empty, but he formed it to be inhabited. What a beautiful, habitable planet we have. How extraordinary it is in its provision of everything that we need to live here. The greatest scientist that ever lived is probably Sir Isaac Newton. He said this, design is obvious. Atheism is senseless. When I look at the solar system, I see the earth at the right distance from the sun to receive the proper amounts of heat and light. This did not happen by chance. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being. This being governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as the Lord over all. And on account of his dominion, he is wont to be called Lord God or universal ruler. The supreme God is a being eternal, infinite, absolutely perfect. Wow. And all the evidence in the world around us from the disciplines of astronomy, geology, biology, all point to the truth of God's word. Hallelujah. Man, we really do, well, man and woman, <laughs> we really do serve an amazing God. A God who's given us his word and it is true from beginning to end. So friends, what do we do about all this? I want to encourage you to get equipped I've shared with you about the Creation magazine, I've shared with you some of the testimonies. Let me tell you a couple of others. This guy uh, uh, wrote to us and said, you guys make evangelism easy. I just give a Creation magazine to somebody and then the next time I see them, we talk about it. That's a great way of doing evangelism, isn't it? And this person said, I took some Creation mags with me this morning to a drop-in centre. 
and left them on the coffee table. When I came back, they'd all been picked up and were being read. I told the people to take them home, so here I am ordering some more. That's the way to do evangelism. And it truly is. You see, Creation Magazine, friends, is a high-quality product. It's aimed at lay people. You don't have to be a scientist to read it. And in the center, there's a section for kids. It's fantastic. comes out four times a year, and I thoroughly commend it to you. It's good, faith-building, God-honoring material. For a one-year subscription or three years, uh, if you subscribe, you get not only the print version of the magazine, but also, as I've explained, the, the digital version as well. And if you subscribe for one year, you'll get this free DVD on f called Fallout. It's great to give to people who may think this, this whole issue of origins is a, is a side issue or not important. It shows the impact on young people who have been exposed to the case, scientific case, for the truth of the Bible. For a three-year subscription, you'll have not only the Fallout DVD, but also the choice of one or other of these two, How Darwin Got It Wrong or Creation Evangelism. We have a book called Our Amazing Created Solar System, a collection of articles from our website edited by Russell Grigg and compiled there. A set of three fantastic DVDs by Spike Pissaris. The first one is called Our Created Solar System. Uh, the next one is called Our Created Galaxy, and the third one, Our Created Universe. And we have packs up there, some I mentioned uh, this morning, the Core Issues Pack, uh, which is a collection of eight DVDs at less than half price. And friends, we have uh, uh, also, I've got a few of these things up here, the Genesis account, which uh, I think Carl has shown you before and I referred to as well. This is uh, a theological, historical and scientific commentary on the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Absolutely marvellous material um, from Jonathan Safety. And this DVD recently re released is Genesis History. We have some copies of it up the back. Uh, a man called Dr. Del Tackett who did the Truth Project, some of you may be familiar with. And uh, it's an, an excellent DVD that affirms the truth of the scriptures. So friends, don't forget too, our amazing website with fabulous resources. So let me close with quoting Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. You see, friends, nowhere on this planet is there anywhere where people have not seen the heavens declaring God's glory as a testimony to his amazing creation and to his, uh, his person. But let's not get confused by the science. As I said before, we don't do this because of our interest in science. We do it because of our passion for the gospel. You see, you can get confused by the science and stuff and uh, it's a bit like a, a mariner on a ship you know he looks at the lighthouse and uh, he gets fixated by the timing of the the flashes and he might even analyze the spectrum of the light he misses the point of the light which is to guide him to a safe haven and that's why God provides not only his word but also all the confirming evidence in the world around you as King David said, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You see, friends, I believe our response should be that of King David, one of worship. Do you know we are the only beings that God created in the entire universe in his image? He loves us so much. He waged a war against the enemy that cost him the life of his only son. And you know, believers are the trophies of that war. The greatest expression, I think, of God's glory is those in whom he has placed his own Holy Spirit, regenerated by love. So friends, if you're here tonight and you have maybe never taken that step of faith before to know your creator God in a personal way, the Bible says that you can do so. And it's not about doing lots of good things, as I explained the other night. It doesn't work that way. It's simply acknowledging who he is, repenting and believing. And the Bible says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. And that means that God places his own Holy Spirit into the heart of every single believer. What an extraordinary transaction that is. God's Spirit indwells us. And the Bible says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. You see, we can understand the creation as outlined in the book of Genesis, really only if we have become new creations, because it's God's Holy Spirit that leads us into truth and illuminates his word for us. The heavens really do declare the glory of God. Amen. Let me invite the musicians to come back up again and we'll just close with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it is with awe and wonder that we stand here and are in your presence tonight. We are full of awe and wonder at all that you have created, all that you have done for us, Lord, but above all for the cross that, Father, you sent your Son, Jesus, to pay the price for our rebellion against you. That, Lord, through faith we can come to know you as our Creator God, as our Lord and as our Saviour. Father, I thank you for the extraordinary gifts you have given to each and every one of us. I pray, Father, that if there's anyone here tonight who has not taken that step of faith, that they will indeed do so knowing that all the evidence in the world around us supports that conclusion, supports your word, supports the truth of what you have done for us in history. So thank you, Lord. I thank you for this weekend. I thank you for the fellowship that we've been able to experience with you and with each other. And Lord, we just go from this place filled with faith, I trust and believe, and renewed in our passion to serve you and to seek you in all of your, our lives and in every way. Thank you, Lord. And all the people said, Amen. Amen.